Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I'm delighted to have a returning guest, Daniele Bellelli. He's a university professor, martial artist, and host of the world-renowned podcast, History on Fire. <laughs> Website is History on Fire Podcast. Dot com coming in from California. Uh, you can find him on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Daniele Bellelli and the number one, Daniele Bellelli one. Uh, we're going to discuss some of his recent episodes um, among uh, uh, the amongst the uh, the Sand Creek Massacre, uh, the massacre at My Lai in Vietnam, and uh, and how human nature plays into all that. It's a very fascinating um, um, investigation into the human mind and the human psyche. And also he did, a, I think it was a two-part series on ancient Rome and gladiators, uh -huh. and then uh, some awesome uh, series on the life of Crazy Horse and what happened in the Black Hills. So a lot of awesome stuff to talk about. So, uh, Daniele, thank you so much for coming back. I really love your work. My pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. I, I see you interviewed on uh, on Joe Rogan. You guys have awesome conversation, and I learned a lot. <laughs> and uh, and I'm like, wow, I really I really want to. I, I got a, a lot to discuss with this guy again. <laughs> yeah. So um so yeah so so maybe uh, maybe b before we get into all that, for anybody who hasn't heard or who doesn't know who you are, can you just give them a, a quick like couple minute rundown of of your background? Sure. I uh, grew up in Italy, moved to the U.S. by now a long time ago, even though my accent just never goes away. <laughs> but um, I've been for the last, um, I guess, 17 years, something like that. I've been teaching in college, primarily history and American Indian studies. And then uh, I've written four books and I'm currently doing a couple of different, I mean, primarily History on Fire and also The Drunken Taoist. So I'm podcasting quite a bit. Yes, yes. I, I first heard about you uh, from an interview with um, um, Prof. CJ and the Dangerous History Podcast. Oh yeah, and, I, oh I love that podcast as well. And yep. uh, and I'm like, if yeah, he thinks very... if he thinks this guy is good, he must be good. So that's how I first heard yeah, you. Yeah. And I started I, like from, this one. I started it's from the great. beginning with Utsi the Ice Man, which is a yes. fascinating tale. I think I think you were saying the uh, the first murder mystery what was that like five thousand years ago, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's crazy. Damn, it's, it's, it's completely crazy story. Yeah, yeah, crazy stuff. Uh, but yeah, let's get into um, the Sand Creek Massacre, which was a very, very... I mean, these these kind of massacres, again, like the name suggests, it's not a fight. You know, it's not an equal... Um, no. You know, not equal sides battling for domination. It's like one side just massacring a group of innocent or, you know, men, women, and, or mostly women and children mm -hmm. who yep. are completely unarmed and like, completely surprised, taken by surprise, and, oh, very unfortunate to to listen to the story but but uh, i think it does reveal a lot of what human nature is um and how it acts in in that kind of situation so can you so so what are your what are your reflections on on why you did that and what you uh you know the conclusions you drew from it i think what was interesting me about those stories about uh sand creek we did, did have this parallel episode about sand creek massacre in colorado in 1864 and my Lai massacre in vietnam in 1968 and what interests me about comparing those two stories was the fact that they were, in both occasions, they are horrible, nasty massacres perpetrated by the U.S. Army. But at the same time, you also have the fact that there were U.S. soldiers there in both cases. We, in one case, they were the people who stopped the massacre. And in another case, they just opposed it and then testified against it, against the people involved. And all. so it was interesting to me to show that there was sometimes we paint things in a way that's overly simplistic, where it's like you either have uh, 
uh, the good guys or the bad guys or the story like all the Americans are good or all the Americans are bad or all the natives are good or all the natives are bad. And in reality, I was interested in the fact that individuality plays a big role in this story. That you have uh, different individuals wearing the same uniforms reacting completely different ways to the same order. You know, when told, uh, go and shoot that three-year-old, one guy goes, yes, sir, no problem, and go shoot him. And the other one goes, no, are you insane? That's not who we are. That's not what we do. And so that's what kind of intrigued me. It's like, what is that makes somebody go along with some horrific stuff? And what is that makes somebody else, even in the face of paying some heavy price, possibly, uh, decide not to go with it? Yeah, yeah. There's the idea of uh, in in voluntarism. Me studying this philosophy is that obedience is the opposite of morality. Yep. In, in that, when you are put into a situation, or when you put yourself into a situation of abdicating your own moral agency for that mm -hmm. of another person, um, you are no longer a human being. You yep. are a robot, basically, <laughs> right? And it doesn't yep. matter. It doesn't matter if it's a human being or even if it's a book, like the Bible. Like you know, they said sure. you know, this book says it's okay, so it's okay to do this thing. You know, anything. Yeah. So it, that's that's completely antithetical to what it means to be a free thinking and having free will human being. And I think the fact is, most people just go along with whatever they are taught which is the reason why some of the things that are completely normal in one historical period, they are seen as horrible at another period and vice versa. You know, why is it that the majority of people born in the 1700s would be completely okay with slavery? And if you say the same thing today, you are in that case. Um, it really just boils down to the majority of human beings go with the critical mass. Wherever there's most consensus, they will go with it. And so that's what interests me is, you know, what is that makes some people actually individuals? Why is it, uh, what does it take for somebody to actually be an individual who has some principles, regardless of what everyone else is saying, regardless of the social context, regardless of all the other stuff? Um, because I don't see that very often. I don't see that very often in any historical period. I see most people just going along with whatever norms that they are Told the what they are told is the right thing to do, and that's that doesn't mean they are evil, but it means they can be swayed in any which way. If uh, under good pressure they will turn to a good direction, under evil pressure they will turn into an evil direction. They are just they get led in any direction possible by the powers that be. Oh yeah, and that's such a dangerous phenomenon. Uh, there's a um, some psychological experiments that were done. Um, I I think, I'm, I want to say the 60s or 70s, um, I think one of them was the Ash Conformity Experiment. I don't know if you heard mm -hmm. of this. Yeah, um, yeah the uh, Prof. T.J. was, he, he interviewed a guy, also I interviewed him, Jim, Jim Cunningham. Uh, he was a psychologist and he was, t and he's, he's an expert on this stuff. And basically showing how exactly what you said, when people um, see something to be objectively true, like, you know, which, uh -huh. which line is longer, this line or that line, and everyone else in the room says the wrong answer, that person questions whether <laughs> whether yeah. they're right or wrong, and they most of the time change to conform with everyone else because nobody wants to be the nail that sticks up that gets hammered down, right? Yep. And and that, that's just human nature, and and how and how that can, in some situations, lead to some truly horrifying results because you know when you put your when, when those kind of people put themselves in in a situation where they become what's called order followers as in the military as in law enforcement you know uh -huh. and it's th those kind of people are the most dangerous because like you said they're not evil they just maybe lack moral fortitude and strength inside to resist uh yep. an order that uh, uh, you know a morally capable person would deem to be insane yep absolutely and I think that's what it is. It really boils down to weakness, to the fact that most people just lack that uh, fortitude, lack principles, ultimately, in the sense that those principles are clearly not strong enough to survive under pressure. And so, you know, if they are principles, they are like, oh, this is what I believe. Well, this is what I believe doesn't mean crap, because when, when pressure is applied, unless you are almost, in that case, I mean, in cases like these, like massacres, where the odds so that if you stand up against them, there's a very serious possibility that you yourself may be killed. Right, right. 
that means that those principles need to be strong enough that you are willing to die for them. Mm. That's not an easy kind of thing to go for. You know, that's not something that most people. So, you know, it's one thing to say, if you ask uh, people when they are sitting on the couch, would you engage in such and such conduct? The overwhelming majority of people would say, no, of course. Mm. But in once you apply pressure, all that stuff goes out the window because those principles have never been tested. They have never been tested under fire, both literally and figuratively. And so there's, you don't know how you're going to react. On the other hand, if like I give you an example, I was, there's the third part of this um, Sankrik Milai part where we sit down and kind of draw some conclusion. It's coming up soon. I brought up there is a more mundane example for me to the life, right? One of the things that I mentioned was, like take something like where used of the idea of monogamy and believe that not only is it the right thing to do, it's how it's supposed to be, right? I personally am not that sold, but in my mind, if you agree to that, if you enter into a relationship and you give your word, which is like, okay, this is the deal, okay, fine, this is how, then, there, then you don't break it ever for any reason, you know, because you've just given your word. And that to me is like, there is no... There is no taking your word back when you give it. You know what I mean? It's like when but you don't give it lightly. And what I see instead all the time is all these people who are philosophically way more pro-monogamy than I would ever be, but yet in practice regularly failing to live up to it and regularly. And I'm like, mm. like if you leave that stuff, why don't you live up to it? Mm. And if you can't live up to it, then consider the fact that maybe those are not the values that you really believe in, you know, but like, don't, don't tell yourself lies. Let's not make stuff up. You know, let's not bullshit each other. Let's be real about it. Like, are you really convinced that that's the way you to live? If you are convinced, then leave it. It's not that hard. And if you're not convinced, don't say something just because you have been told that it's the right thing to say, except you can't live up to it in practice. So I don't really understand that thing of how people are, how so many people have one, their ideals and their practice completely don't match. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I don't get it, man. Like to me, is I don't have that many moral rules. I actually have very, very few. <laughs> but among them, there is the idea that once you give your word, in my mind, you know, I take it very samurai style. In my mind, you know, the way you say sorry for breaking your word is you grab a two foot long knife and you stick it in your stomach and oh, you twist from side to side. There is no <laughs> sorry. There is no exception. You know what uh, I mean? It's like it's your word. Right. If you can't keep your word, you should be dead. That's where it's at. <laughs> you know, it's like otherwise that to me is integrity. It's right, right. just where it's at. Otherwise, if you are not. And so in that sense, that's why to me, I'm intrigued with how many people may have all, whatever their values are, are a very superficial thing in that sense. They are not something that when tested against real in tough circumstances is going to survive. I mean, if you can't even like stick to monogamy marriage after you say, yes, I strongly believe in it, good luck sticking to your principle where every bullets are flying and you're seeing people dying all around you and mm -hmm. everybody's screaming and yelling. You're not going to. Of course you're not. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, great example. And um, and also it brought to mind how when, you know, truly monumental shifts in, you know, the understanding of how, you know, culture, uh, you know, the beliefs of various cultures uh, should work, you know, mm -hmm. it usually happens with a very small minority of passionate individuals that brings, and usually, you know, very, very strongly motivated by principle, and basically, they're the ones that, that affect everyone else. Everyone else <laughs> sees mm -hmm. these people and they're like, oh, you know, maybe chain slavery is a bad idea. <laughs> maybe we should get rid yep. of it. And then everyone's like, all right, so let's get rid of it. <laughs> So it's not exactly. to say that everybody exactly. was, was immoral or evil. It's just that sure. maybe they lacked the moral fortitude to say it out loud. Um, yep. And as you said, perhaps because at, at, at the core, they are cowards <laughs> yep. fearing for, you know, the consequences of such an unpopular position. Of course, of course. And it's, um, it's hard to be an individual. It's not an easy thing. 
because life is scary, because you know, there's pressure from other people, but there's also forget even the pressure, for, like the uh, the consequences from other people. Even just from ourselves, most people love to gravitate toward uh, an organization with a strong and powerful leader who give them the 12 rules to live by and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, um, because people are scared to be who they are without guidance that way or without, not even guide, because guidance, you can get guidance, but without a structure, without a dogma in a way. You know, people use dogma like it's a bad word, and in my mind, it definitely is. But the reality is that most people love dogma. I mean, the reality is, please, dear dogma, hold me tight when <laughs> the night is dark and it's cold. And, right. you know, it gives you security. It makes you feel like you're part of something. It makes you feel like, oh, oh, there are all these other people who dress like me, who believe like me, who stick to the 12th principle or whatever the hell. And so we must be right. It's psychologically reassuring. And for anybody who is any less than having this insane degree of uh, confidence in their own path, that kind of assurance is highly appealing and is not something that many human beings can live without. Mm -hmm. Of course, the price to pay for that, for getting that, is your individuality. Yeah. Which yeah, which is the the road less traveled by, <laughs> definitely. Yep. Um. And and the and the other thing I I I um I got from the uh, the Sand Creek Massacre and the and the Milai episodes were how both cases were instituted by um soldiers, right? People, agents working on behalf mm -hmm. of the state, right? And it kind of reminds me that you know the yep. the double standard that a private individual doing the ex very exact same thing, <laughs> or let's say a group of private individuals, let's say a gang, oh, yeah. you know, would be met with harsh punishment. And yet with the soldiers, it's like, it's part of war, right? So, so, right. Like, so like the, yep. the quote, um, you know, one, one death, one death is a tragedy. Well, no, kill one man, you're a murderer. Kill, you know, thousands of men, yep. you, you're a conqueror. Kill everyone, right. you're, you're God, right? <laughs> <laughs> right uh so yeah so it's it's uh yeah definitely amazing the um the double standard that, oh hey <laughs> is that isabella yeah that's hey. my daughter <laughs> <Been in. laughs> no problem uh so so yeah so let's uh let's go on to um your your i guess i guess we, we can transition since the you know sand creek massacre had to do with the the natives so your mm -hmm. the discussion of of crazy horse um, you know, I thought that was, you know, I, I love when you, you know, when you do specific personalities, like, like I, I yeah. remember you saying on the Joe Rogan show, how his style, like Dan Carlin's style is more yeah. panoramic, macro, macroscopic, yeah. right. And you, you like to focus in on specific people, which is, which is a great, you know, you get a really, uh, in-depth view of, of a person's life. And I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. And same thing with the Jack Johnson uh, series. Yeah. So, so yeah. So go. Get, yeah, I, I had. Uh, in fact, those are sometimes probably my favorite episodes. Are the biographies, are the ones where I focus on one individual, and you know, you get the historical picture and what's going on and all of that. But the fact is, you are I'm primarily focusing on one individual, and so that's kind of what I'm digging. Uh, I find it way more interesting, way more. Um, like you can go deeper. It's like we are in many ways as people who are character driven. You know what I mean? We like to get into stories where there's a lead character, where there's somebody that you can relate to. Having big stories about the big picture is awesome. It's interesting, but it's harder to get into right. because uh, it's kind of like think about any movie you've ever watched. You get into it because of the characters most of the time. If mm -hmm. the characters are not appealing, it's uh, kind of, you know, the world they paint may be an interesting one, mm -hmm. but it's hard to get into it. And so I find myself that when I started covering some individuals in history, you know, I did uh, Caravaggio, the Italian painter, oh, I did Crazy amazing, Horse, yeah. <laughs> I did Theodore Roosevelt, I okay. did um, um, Jack Johnson, yeah. all of those guys. Those are the ones that in my mind stick out the most, like, oh, I love that one. That <laughs> one was so much fun, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having, yeah, and, and it's a different style, you know, yeah, I mean, I love Dan Carlin to death, I think he does an amazing job, but his, uh, his game is more big picture, he's less uh, character driven, I am very, very, very character driven. Yeah, yeah, and I certainly appreciate that, I mean, um, and, and I also like when you do portray um, the Native Americans, you, you, you preface it by saying that, 
You know, I'm not saying that the Native Americans are all wonderful, you know, people just living in the in the prairies <laughs> and, and and you know, with no problems, you know, and then and the uh, you know, the the Westerners would come in or you know, they're completely evil. No, of course not. You know, sure. they, there's good and bad on both sides. They're they're just human beings, <laughs> you know, and uh, and they all have different temperaments and different personalities and they clash with the with the Westerners who have different temperaments and different cultures. Yeah. And and so it's important to give them um uh, you know, just just uh, depth, you know, because when we paint them all in one way, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you rob them of and that that's, depth. I think, totally. And I think that's what I was digging about these stories, that on the surface it looked like, oh, you pick Mila and you pick Sun Creek because you are anti-American and you hate. And it's like, no, that's not the point. In mm. some way I pick an American topic because most of my listeners are from the U.S., right. So it's harder to dismiss, you know, if I was talking about the Nazis or the Soviets or whoever else, it's like, ah, oh, it's those guys out there. They are bad people. That's right. why they do these things. Right. When you bring it a little closer to home, then people feel like, oh, wait, but that means you're anti-American. And the point is like, no, because also some of the heroes in both of the stories were American soldiers, mm. you know. So mm. what really boils down to me is the complex is individuals. It's yeah. that's the level that interests me. You know, there were no like that's why to me nationalism makes no sense right. is because I don't I don't fault anybody because they happen to be from the same nation as somebody else I hate and I don't praise anybody because they happen to be from somebody some nation that I mm -hmm. with other people I like mm -hmm. means like there's you as a human being period I don't care about your membership in any group because the reality is that any group both the ones you are born into, whether by skin color or nation or whatever, and the ones you choose to join, even the ones you choose to join based on some kind of ideological thing, there are, in every one of them, there are going to be awesome human beings and awful human beings, you know? So I'm not really interested in groups for group's sake. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in uh, how a specific individual, you know, that group thinking is lazy thinking ultimately it's because you don't want to get to know that individual and that individual and that individual and that right. individual. So instead what you do is like, oh, I'll plug you into my mental file of those people who have that skin color or come from that nation and you guys are all the same anyway. That's just laziness, you right. know? right. Yeah, the, the, to me that that uh, reminds me of the appeal to genetics uh, logical fallacy, which is basically, you know, let's say Thomas Jefferson said a, a wonderful quote that you know is considered, you know, intellectual and wise, and then someone says, well, Thomas Jefferson had slaves, so that means yeah. that invalidates every single thing that he ever said. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, or or like or like if uh, you know if Isaac Newton you know discovered a new branch of mathematics, but then you say, well, no, but then he went mad later in life, so. So that invalidates every all the math that he pre no, of course not. <laughs> so like you said, no, I mean, and that's ahead, and yeah. this is where it gets uh, I'm sorry, that's what to me where it gets interesting is the the pl the place where most people start is the moral absolute. Somebody's either all good or all evil. They if they are good people, then I'm gonna pretend that all the bad stuff they may have done doesn't exist. And if they are bad people, I'm gonna ignore you know, basically trying to ignore the complexity. Right. If people snap out of that, then they get into a more relativistic territory where ah, everything is a shade of gray. You know, good people do bad things and bad people also sometimes do good things, and which is true, but that's also a cop out. That's also too easy. You know, mm. to me, it's interesting where it's like there are people who are, you know, if you are. 95% you do sweet six and you happen to have a few moments of fuck ups. That's very, that's a different shade of gray from being, <laughs> a, you know, a serial killer who one day let an old lady cross the street, you know, <laughs> it's not the same. They are not, right, right, well, right. they are all shades of gray. There right, are right. different ways attached to it. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that one is 100, you know, 100 and zero is very rare. It's mm -hmm. very rare to find somebody who's 100% sweet and perfect in all circumstances or 100% absolutely evil in all circumstances. Mm -hmm. But even though we do acknowledge complexity, and we should, then there's also the fact that, you know, some comp some people are clearly better human beings than others in the sense of uh, in moral qualities, in aptitudes, in mm -hmm. the impact that they have on other people, despite their feelings. And some horrible people, we acknowledge that they may have their good moments, but they are still horrible people at the end of the day when you take into account all the good and bad they have done. Yeah, maybe one um, 
you know, one example or a few examples of this are, are you know, the mass murders that we're seeing in like schools and, you know, uh, movie theaters now. And, you know, most people say, well, those people are evil. And and then there's a uh, there's a um, a YouTube channel, Free Domain Radio, Stefan Molyneux. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he yeah. he often does uh, just like you. Um, he does complete, you know, comprehensive background history of these people after they, you know, the life of these people. What were their child like? What were their childhood like? What was their parents like? What were their childhood sure. like? You know, and it reveals a lot. Of, and, and not only that, but then. How was their experience at school? How were their friends? Did mm-hmm. they have friends? How were they treated? Were they insulted constantly? You know, were they sure. made fun of and picked on? Like, like people think that these mass murders c- happen out of the blue and that they're just evil people. No, maybe they were poked and prodded and driven to a state of madness. And, you know, all, all everyone else sees is the tragedy at the end. But if you look at the life in its totality, it's a logical conclusion to all of the sure. insults of their of their previous time. And I think that's kind of where the Milai or Sun Creek things were about in some way. It's like, ultimately still evil. You know what I mean? It's like you massacre, you rape and massacre a bunch of civilians. Yeah, that's evil. There's no argument about it. Mm. That, but it's too easy and lazy to just say, well, they are evil people, end of story. You want to understand what is that make probably what's a relatively average human being end up doing some horrible things. Now, that still means that that person has chosen to go down a very evil path. So if we want to make the judgment call at the end, yes, that is evil. There's no argument. So people confuse understanding with justifying, you know, that if we somehow we try to understand what is that makes somebody be the way they are, Mm. then we're justifying it. No, we're not justifying it at all. You're still an asshole for doing it. But I can understand how somebody put into... It, and again, the moment people say, I understand, people say, oh, you're justifying it, that means you're okay. It's like, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. I still put a bullet in your head if I have to. You know what I mean? It's still, you're a horrible human being and you need to go. Right, right. I understand how you got to be the way you are still. Right. I do get it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, yeah, I remember he, Stefan Mali did also did um, The Life of Hitler <laughs> and and the, yeah. the the childhood of Hitler. Wow, like like the amount of abuse and neglect and and abandonment and oh torture and it's just it's just amazing what you know what what uh, the amount of pain that a child can endure and still mm-hmm. to most people appear to be a functioning human being and yet sure. when put into a position of power you know wield an amazing amount of you know terror. <laughs> So yeah, mm-hmm. so so Absolutely. so yeah, so, so yeah, like like for the for example, the crazy horse. I think I think you mentioned that um, like his entire family was killed right uh, throughout yep. his life, and he was the last to survive. And he was basically like I don't know, like a desperado type of guy, just like would I don't know, killing machine, like trying to avenge. Yep. Right? Was that is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, it's he he's a guy who clearly. F- was an amazing warrior at a time when warfare was the norm for his people, both against the United States, against other tribes. And he went through a lot. I mean, he saw pretty much everybody he cared about dying one way or another, starting with his mom killing herself when he was five years old, through, you know, seeing uh, his daughter die at a very young age of diseases. He saw uh, his uncle got killed in battle, his best friend got killed in battle, his brother got killed in battle. He's many of, you know, it's like the list go on and on and on and everybody he gets close to die mm. in perfectly horrible ways. Oh. Well, that is going to mess with your head, oh, yeah. you know. And I think like one of, there's, there's one moment when his uh, younger brother gets killed that he just he and his wife alone, they go to the place where he was killed, find the bones, uh, kind of put them up on the scaffold in Lakota style, the way they would do for the dead. Mm -hmm. And then his way of dealing with it is just literally going out and hunting settlers and, you know, going out and finding soldiers, finding settlers, hunting them down and killing them. You know, it's like, they're like, they are enemies. They are people I wouldn't mind killing anyway, Mm -hmm. but now I have an extra reason for it. I'm hurting. And the way that I'm going to silence that pain is by killing all these bastards. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really a yeah, really amazing thing to learning about his life. I, I I didn't know too much about it. Um, I mean, I, I read a little bit about it. You know, learning about the history of native uh, native people. But uh, wow, <laughs> you covered it in such excellent uh, excellent uh, detail and depth. So, uh, and also, so let's go into the um, uh, the ancient Rome series because that that I mean, all of them fascinate me. But that's that was an awesome one as well. I mean, I I knew. I I didn't know that much, I guess uh, about about I guess mo- what most people know, you know, from the Gladiator <laughs> movie, mm-hmm. from also from the uh, the series Gladiator, uh, Gladiator. Yep. Right? Uh, it, oh no, yeah, it's called Gladiator. Yeah. Um, yep. And uh, and I think uh, that also has uh, Spartacus, right? Oh uh, yeah, Spartacus. Yeah. Of course. Right, right. Um, and um, yeah, so I I really yeah really appreciated that because it, it to me it made it more. Um, realistic, because you know sometimes, many times, when you see these things portrayed on the on the screen in film or series, um, I mean series, I guess less that they can get in more detail, more depth. But the film definitely, it um, it just uh, you know makes it a little bit more glamorous, showy, <laughs> and, and whereas you really you really brought out the reality of it, you know, of of all the different like I didn't even know all the different types of people. That would fight yeah. in the stadium, not not just gladiators. All well, those gladiators were the main event. So yeah, so, yeah so so so, can you get, please get into what what did you take away from that, and what why did you cover that? What... I mean, the gladiators is one of those interesting topics because you get uh, like this whole idea of uh, essentially death becoming public entertainment for ancient Romans. And it wasn't actually the gladiators was probably the least lethal events because gladiators didn't always die in a fight. You know, they were actually more often than not, they survived to fight another day. The potential of somebody dying was always there. And once in a while it happens, but that wasn't the point. But all the other events that they had in the arena on the same day as the gladiators were usually highly lethal. Mm. They had uh, these uh, hands pitting um, professional hunters against animals. They had uh, public executions. They had, uh, because public execution is not just you go in and you stick a sword in somebody, but they made them these elaborate plays, uh, turning them into a between like theater and public execution. They would do this really weird stuff that was, I mean, the games were about death, basically, you know, and then. The gladiators were actually the one moment that could be seen more as a redeeming moment in the show in terms of because the rest, I mean, the rest is really about the the power of the state, Mm. you know, like public executions are is about showing you we will crush in horrendous way anybody who doesn't stick to our loads. Uh, The animal hunts in a way you can also make that argument because it's about showing the supremacy of Rome over nature. Mm. The fact that Rome could crush anything, you know, there were animals from all the parts of the empire that they conquered. So right. it was against the statement of look how badass we are <laughs> and we can destroy all this, and, you know. Yeah. But the gladiator part is more interesting to me because there's that moment where, you know, the gladiators lived in a space where you're completely alone. You know, they're just one man against one man in front of thousands of people watching and the primary reason why people are there is less the i mean i'm sure there is some aspect of uh you know blood and gore and just enjoying that kind of stuff but there's also an element of seeing one of the things that made the gladiators popular was their courage their ability to be brave in the face of death and in a world that was as brutal as ancient Rome was, that was the one value that everybody respected. So that even if a guy was essentially a slave, most of the time, not always, by the way, there were gladiators who were volunteers who chose to become gladiators. But, you know, you get somebody who, in many cases, who came from the lowest of the low in society, and yet he can put on this deal display of amazing bravery and composure in the face of the scariest thing possible that was inspiring that was seen as uplifting that was seen as like a, in some way a role model something that you could learn from it was like a master class in stoicism in action not hmm. just in words hmm. yeah yeah so many so many topics uh so many points to talk about it, about that series that, that it brought up um i mean i mean one of them one of them is is that uh you know like you said the power of the state like you said i remember you were saying how 
they would bring in these exotic animals from from places that they conquered and that mm-hmm. as as time went on and and those animals became in short supply cuz they kept killing them all <laughs> so they had yeah. to expand their empire to satiate their thirst or their 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 hunger for <laughs> for these exotic animals <laughs> yeah big time oh uh, that was fascinating and and the other thing is like you said um you know it's easy to look at the ancient romans and say how barbaric and savage they are because of these because of these games and how they loved watching mm-hmm. people die, fight to the death, and 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 how terrible it is. And then and then you and then I and then you think like, wait a minute, but people today, they still like watching violence and blood and gore. Oh, of course, that's still of that's course. still what people. Love. Maybe it's not real death, but they still like watching the simulation of it. So really, what is the difference? <laughs> yeah, you know. It's yeah, still, it's still, absolutely. and also not even in not even in movies, but also in video games. Like, like you know, a lot of people who are against um, video games, they say, "Oh, well, it, it makes people into into kill serial killers." You know, maybe those people that killed up, you know, that shot up all those people in mm-hmm. schools and, and and movie theaters, maybe it's because they played too much video games and they got ideas. Whereas, I I think it's more likely the possibility that watching or pl- you know watching those types of mo- violent movies or playing those types of violent video games probably satiates that desire to you know to do that because maybe that is i don't know a human design like maybe people are, are wondering like what happens how does it has mm-hmm. the person die what if you what if you stab him here what if you shoot him there what happens you know so it's it's a yeah. you know so so maybe <laughs> maybe it it it, it uh it sat- satisfies that so it decreases the possibility for more violence so what, what, what sure. are your thoughts on of that? course yeah it's i mean in some way aggression and violence are human are part of the human psyche or it's part of what make us who we are so to assume that they are just going to disappear and then everybody live happily in peace and harmony hugging each other yeah good <laughs> luck with that that's just not the way human nature works so i think figuring out ways to channel those impulses in less destructive ways you know, rather than wanting to go to war for the sake of feeling that bravery, toughness thing, right. if instead you just uh, go fight in MMA, it's probably a lot healthier, you know. Mm. It's one of the things that is like, to just say you shouldn't feel that way, those are bad instincts. It's like, yeah, that's like saying, just say no, you know. It's one of the right. things, it just doesn't work. So, but finding ways to channel that into something, uh, if nothing else, less negative and ideally more positive, that to me, that's an interesting challenge. You know, that's something where, hell, I would love even if uh, wars were, you know, everybody agreed where you have, you know, it's different with terrorism, but when you have states, let's have a war where, you know, the... 30 politicians from one country and 30 <laughs> I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that <laughs> get their swords and you know you are the one who voted for the war okay right. you're the one who goes fighting with your other 30 <laughs> colleagues in the coliseum and we all sit back have a beer and right. you know and and enjoy the pay-per-view <laughs> yeah i think that's a major difference of uh, of warfare um, in terms of the state, uh, like centuries ago, as compared with today, whereas centuries ago it was more often the arist- arist- um, aristocracy and the nobles that yep. would that would go off and head the charge yep. to war, and and sometime I don't know when or how that changed, but slowly things changed, and you know, like they say, old man, old man war, poor man's fight, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's the um, the poor middle class that go off and die, and and. Yep. Um, and, and same thing, you know. Look at the Civil War uh, of the uh, the United States, right? A lot of a lot of poor whites and blacks went off to die. Um, very unfortunate, and and so often you see that where the <laughs> the old men so willing to go to war, you know, but when it's their own child on the line, whew, big big difference. That's what I thought was interesting about Theodore Roosevelt, because I mean, on one end, Roosevelt was very much a warmonger. You know, mm-hmm. he never ran into a war he didn't like. He just was big on it in a way that's mildly disturbing in you know more ways than one at the same time he wasn't a hypocrite he was the guy you know when he was 40 years old long past the time when anybody expected him to serve in a war he was under secretary of the navy he said hey i've been campaigning for this war so i'm gonna go fight it i'm gonna leave my government job and i'm gonna be in the first line fighting it out and that's just of course i'm not 
mean, hell, when he was 60 years old or something like that, he wanted to fight in World War One, <laughs> And he begged Wilson to say, let me go already and lead wow. the regiment and stuff. You know, at least the guy, I appreciate, regardless of whether one agrees or not with the conclusion, mm -hmm. but it, you can clearly respect a lot more somebody who's willing to put their body on the line behind their principles, whether you agree with the principles or not, versus the guy guy was you know we are going to fight this war it's like no you're not going to do anything you're gonna <laughs> sit back and have a cocktail while everybody else go die you know so i that's one of the things that i thought was interesting about roosevelt that you know there are a lot of dark sides in his personalities but there's also a lot to admire and uh, i found that interesting right there that uh, i can't really think of too many guys who have that kind of integrity in uh, and again, integrity does not mean that one agrees with his conclusion in all situations. Far from it. You know, mm. there are plenty of things where I think he was nuts. Mm. But um, but I appreciate the fact that he wasn't somebody who was going to send somebody else to do his job. Right. Right, and and it w wasn't there a point in his life? I think when um, when he went out by himself, like to live in the woods, some some for a, a yeah, period yeah. of time, he right? Went out, uh, yeah, no, he was nuts. I mean, he was clearly <laughs> an adrenaline junk. The, the way even Roosevelt ended up being president is hilarious because he was clearly not a politician in a classical sense. He he, he came back from the war in in Cuba as a war hero. He was popular enough, so. You know, the, they needed in the Republican Party somebody to run for governor of New York. And so they convinced the boss of Republican politics in New York to run Roosevelt. And the boss was a little sketchy because he was like, I'm not so sure. This guy's a little too independent. We want somebody. They said, no, no, don't worry. We'll... And then when Roosevelt gets in, he starts doing his own thing. He doesn't listen. He goes against some of the policies that the Republican Party is pushing. And so Platt, the, the Republican boss in New York, is trying to figure out a way to get rid of him. Hmm. He's like, how do we make this guy go away? Hmm. And in the election of um, 1900, McKinley needed a vice president. And so they're like, ha ha, we're going to make it look like it's an honor, right? He's like, oh, yeah, you're going to be vice president. And he's popular, so he may even get us some votes. Hmm. But what the hell does a vice president do anyway? You know, it's the place where political careers go to die. So great, you know, perfect way to get rid of the guy. That way we never have to hear from him again. Great plan, except in 1901, McKinley gets assassinated right. and Roosevelt become the youngest president in U.S. history. And you're like, oh, we did not see that coming, you know. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Amazing, amazing life for that guy. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think you were saying that he he was the first president to take, was it jiu-jitsu lessons? Or, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, he was an adrenaline and, and, and he wrestled he, people he boxed, in the White House. Yeah, <laughs> he wrestled, he boxed. Uh, he like, great so, he, yeah. And, and I like the uh, the story of he, uh, he took a bullet in uh, in the chest. Yep. At, at close range and then still went out to give a speech like what a half hour later yep. or something 90 minute speech <laughs> all right you gotta admire that <laughs> yeah while bleeding uh, while bleeding while... right oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah you said you said he he coughed to make sure that it, did, it didn't puncture his lungs like i'm all yeah. right just a flesh wound <laughs> yeah exactly like, i mean you know you, the insanity of it all you can't help but admire right 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 um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, going back to uh, to the the ancient Rome, um, you know, you you were talking about like uh, even even women, even women, some women were gladiators, although it was discouraged. Um, and, yeah. and I think you said that they they segregated the men and the women in the audience uh, the, with the seating arrangements. Uh, and one reason, perhaps, was so that so that the women wouldn't get too close and and wouldn't want to become a gladiator themselves. It, more often, there was the fact that way too many aristocratic women liked gladiators. Right. They were kind of the sex symbols of the time. So yeah. they were like, oh, I don't know about our wives going to, you know, it's like, so that was part of the issue too. And yes, there were female gladiators, uh, kind of like the same way as female MMA today. You get people who are really into it and are very pro. Some who think who are very against it because mm. of gender roles, some of... Uh, you know, all of similar dynamics in some way. 
So you uh, uh, being in a relationship with a female M- MMA fighter, um, mm-hmm. do, you, do you see that as a problem <laughs> for her? That this. <laughs> No, I mean, it's, no, I think it's cool. I think is, uh, um, I mean, it's always tricky in the sense that fighting is um, in, inherently a dangerous game. It's right. always a little scary and it's never fun to think right. of people you care for having to be in a situation where you can get hurt. But um, at the same time, it's like, you know, um, I can, I, you know, I totally get why fighting is appealing. I totally understand that feeling of, you know, there's really nothing else in the world that help you face your fears and weaknesses and mm. help you discover your strengths, like being locked in the cage with one person when there are thousands watching, you mm. know. It's, uh, it's not something that most anybody else get to have that kind of experience, you know. Yeah, I mean, if it makes her happy as well, you know, <laughs> yep, you know, that's, exactly. that's one of the important things. And and the other thing uh, you mentioned in the in the uh, in the Gladiator series about how how well the gladiators were taken care of, I had no idea, <laughs> oh, yeah. like how well they're fed, how well they're you know nourished, and you know yep. massage and <laughs> and just taken care of. Because like if you think about it, I guess they are an investment, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah, and, and so a and, bunch and, of money in them. Yeah, yeah, and and how. Um, and how they don't they really don't want them to die because that's like destroying an investment you know mm-hmm. so Absolutely. so so um so i think like you said that that they didn't often die and and sometimes if the crowd enjoyed a particular gladiator enough even if that gladiator lost they still want they would, wouldn't want him to die yeah exactly right. absolutely yeah there were two different sides of that were not wanting them to die the crowd that you know if you are a popular gladiator whether you win or lose they want you to stay alive and also the the editor of the game because you know right. they have to pay right. a hell of a lot of money for anybody who's um who anybody who dies in the arena you know they have to pay the the trainer of the gladiators for a huge fee so it's like uh, if we are if he does a decent enough job let's figure out a way to spare him you know yeah yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so, any uh, any uh, future um, ideas about what future episodes that you're considering? I'm just curious. Yeah, like I want to do next. Uh, there's um, there's an Italian one that I'm gonna do. That it's more about the um, it's about this criminal gang that emerged in Rome, mm-hmm. and uh, and that she um, like what happened there was it's really interesting because it's like these guys in the 1970s. They started out as like low level gangsters and they just made their way up to becoming like the biggest gangster that ruled Rome hmm. in a way where they had control over the politics, they had control over, they end up in bed with the Vatican, they end up in bed with the state. They are, hmm. it's like the mother of all conspiracy theories. <laughs> so it's hmm. kind of one of the scenes where it's kind of like a, a pretty weird funny story and yet uh, unlike most conspiracy theories this one there's so much evidence behind it that there's no denying kind of what was going on so i mean with the stories primarily late 1970s 1980s um it makes uh, you know mafia and politics it's uh it's it's a rather wild one awesome awesome looking forward to it and 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 also before we go um yeah i just wanted to discuss a little bit uh the the jack johnson uh series that because that yeah. that was really an amazing one i mean i mean i don't know much about um like boxing history but and i never i don't think i ever heard of the guy even but uh but yeah it was it was a great, it was a great story of of a man who grew or a black man living at a time when uh you know i guess i think you said his mother was a slave right so mm-hmm. so it, his parents. yeah him him uh, embarking on his boxing career and completely defying the trends of his time and yep. you know becoming a success and just you know almost living as though you know racism did not exist which is exactly i think the way you should live <laughs> you, right. know, you, you should live the way or maybe treat others the way that you would want yeah. to be treated right and if and, and so he just shrugged it off and like and like, like you were saying that like he he just approached it like it didn't even exist right and he was just smiling yep. and completely content so yeah it was uh yeah jack johnson had bowls of iron there's no <laughs> argument about it you know the guy was just because mm-hmm. I mean it's easy to say leave as if racism doesn't exist but in a place where you're reminded of it every single day right, how do right, you right. do it right. somehow he did you right. know somehow he did manage 
in some way his weapons was his smile. You know, he would smile his way through it all. They were, you know, when he fought uh, Jim Jeffries for the title in the biggest fight, probably possibly ever, but definitely for those days, they were like the story goes that before Johnson climbed into the ring, there were like the the band played a song entitled "All Coons Look Alike to Me," and you know there was these Man. twenty thousand people basically screaming for his death, wow. and Johnson is all smiling, blowing right. kisses to the crowd, <laughs> just like completely untouched by it all. You know, like I'm racism, more racism. I'm not even feeling a breeze here. You know. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i mean yeah that's that's really how you know you you conquer another person's rage is just by you know your the the outward display of your contentment you know yep. you know because yep. people want you to feel affected they want you to oh, they yeah. want you to suffer you know they want you to be hurt and when you show them that no you're not hurting me you're not even affecting me <laughs> yep exactly you know that's like there's the, a guy the, i knew um there was a guy i knew on death row in california um last guy actually to be executed in california at san quentin he had right. this line that he said that i thought was hilarious where he he said um you know the guards were when when he first got in the guards were kind of trying to break him and making things incredible you know they give him no blankets and all of that kind of you know trying to wake him up every hour do stuff to try to kind of make him snap hmm. and uh, he said that his way of handling it was when then they would come around and say hey so slept well last night how are you doing and the guy was like oh man if he was any better i wouldn't be able to stand it and he would just flash this big smile and the guy <laughs> would flip out and you know <laughs> yeah 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 that, i mean to me that that demonstrates the power of of a sense of humor you know yep. and that and that a sense of humor you know true humor originates in tragedy yeah you know like yeah there's uh yeah. gallo's humor is powerful yeah, yeah, and uh, like I, um, I used to do uh, stand-up comedy uh, for a short while, and uh, and I think that uh, you know, especially reflecting on your life, and especially the difficulties and the annoyances and the irritations that you <laughs> that you daily have to deal with, and if you can communicate those uh, well to your audience, they can identify with you, and and they can laugh at you because I think most people. Um, they love to laugh at other people's misery. Isn't that an amazing? Sure. <laughs> it's an amazing yeah. characteristic yeah. of human nature. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So if you want to be, uh, if you want to be a wonderful Santa comedian, just like, just tell them everything that pisses you off and makes you human, basically, and the right. audience will love you. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, there's something about being honest too. You know, that radical honesty about just being upfront. You know, you're not trying to put on a Facebook profile that's all smiles and happiness you're being very very real about it you know oh yeah oh yeah definitely um well wonderful wonderful conversation wonderful talking to you uh daniela i really enjoyed it so so please just reiterate some of the ways um people can um contact you if they want to follow your work sound good so i have uh, i'm on twitter at the, the first initial of my first name so the letter d and then my last name bolelli b-o-l-e-l-l-i so Twitter again is D Bolelli. Uh, Facebook, my public page is Daniela Bolelli, and I think the number one uh, History of Fire podcast website. You know, plus Google is your friend. If you just Google my name, I'm sure all the relevant stuff will pop up. Yes, yes, and please do Google him because he done he's done some excellent work. Not only with History on Fire, I mean, you do the Drunken Taoist podcast. You've written a bunch mm -hmm. of books. You've got like I think you've got um, lectures, right? People can purchase. Yep. Yeah, uh, I did a set of lectures on Taoism. Yeah. Right, right. So you're a busy man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, yep. actually, talk about Taoism. I don't know if I told you, but I, I'm I'm also an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist. So, so that. So I, I guess we we can keep that one for the next time. Yeah, we can do a yeah. So, episode. Yeah, we can. That's what that, that's what inspired me to get into Chinese medicine, Taoism. It's oh, I I love that. <laughs> cool. We that, can do a Taoist one next time. Awesome, awesome. So uh, awesome conversation, uh, Daniele. Thank you very much. So this is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseasofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you so much.
Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.